Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. So you have a great background where you have implemented lots of new processes and change in your background. And now you're doing that for AutoZone and third party risk. So how do you feel um, third party risk is the same as that, you know, a change process and something new you have to get the business on board with? I, I well, from several different aspects. So I think that um, third party risk, for whatever reason, since it's relatively new to the industry, and especially to retail, within a couple of years, one of the things you have to start doing is you have to start looking at the silos that exist among all of the business units and whether or not you running a third party risk program helped create any of those silos. In a lot of ways, it's going to be up to us or to you or that individual or that team to help remove those silos, procurement, sourcing, legal, all of the functional areas, anybody that's gonna to touch the contract. Um, oftentimes, even though we didn't break the heart back in the past, we have to typically be the ones that first say, I'm sorry for the issue that was caused in the past. I understand that um, th there are some complexities around us plugging into your process. So let's do this. Before we plug into your process, let's talk about what pain points that's going to cause you I'll physically help you solve your pain points first. And then once we take care of you, then we'll make sure that our third-party risk process gets plugged in and then taken care of and we'll work out those pain points. But I, I go back to always consistently saying that I am a customer-centric risk manager, which makes me slightly out of the norm. But I am absolutely empathetic to the needs of the business, to the solutions that these vendors provide to business. And therein, the revenue that will return back to that business unit as a result of utilizing that vendor. I'm extremely empathetic to those things. So I, I really fall on a, all across the spectrum um, from a stakeholder management perspective relative to helping those business solve problems. Sometimes I help them solve risk problems and reduce and mitigate risk. That's the general nature of it. But in, in other times, sometimes in order for you to even get buy-in, to be invited to the table, Sometimes you just have to do a favor and kind of help them understand the pain points that uh, will be caused as a result of putting in yet another risk process, yet another process that's going to slow the contract execution process down and really be empathetic to how that will affect their day-to-day -day work and help them solve or mitigate that problem before you can even focus on your own. Does that make sense? I think that makes loads of sense. And we've talked to security for a long time about not being the team that says no. And I think when people come into the industry, that's what they bring. Like what you're saying is it's all about creating solutions and understanding, you know, actually this, this can feel like a problem to people. But are you finding that people in your business kind of understand the need for it? Do they want this as part of their process? I said again, please. I couldn't hear you. That's okay. So are you, do you find that people in your business actually want this as part of their process? Do they understand the need for third party risk? So it's interesting. And I think depending on the industry that you are sitting in plays a huge role in how easily and how quickly you can plug a third party risk team and process into existing processes. So if we're looking at regulated industries, let's just say health and benefits, or the financial sector where beyond just data privacy, there are other governing regulations that play. And these are not just uh, regulations that induce fines, some of which also, also can include jail time like SEC or ERISA violations. Then it's a different culture, it's a different integration. You're pretty much told that those are gonna be, the third party risk is gonna be part of the new processes. And this is why we need to do it. And it's generally readily understood, but I will say that I think you only get, there's a law of diminishing return in that regard. And you're only gonna get to a check the box, a check the box compliance level of uh, activity and involvement, which in, in truthfully in a regulated environment um, is sometimes enough. Uh, and probably in most times enough. I find that where it's a little bit more interesting and a little bit more fun to solve the challenge is in the retail sector. Because again, it really comes down to the generation of revenue. We are all here, even the risk guy, even the third party cyber risk guy is here to help generate revenue. So it's not as simple as really being able to rely or lean on a check the box compliance activity or mentality that it will not get you invited to the table within the retail sector. So again, it goes back to 
So stakeholders really understanding why our internal customers initially even need this vendor. Um, and then ultimately how we provide value over time to the enterprise is that we, we are consistently brought in earlier and earlier in the contract process. So we begin uh, helping the business to implement security as at least one of the decision-making factors when they're choosing their vendors. Um, and I think that is miles from where we started even 36 months ago, and not just at my present organization, but in the retail sector as a whole. Um, I think we have a, a ways to go, but I do think that it's extremely interesting the way the retail sector is uh, tackling third-party cyber risk versus some of the more regulated industries. And I think what you're having to see too is you're having to see people help tackle that and lead that charge who have what I would call an augmented set of skills. And it's not just the technical skills anymore. It's, it, you have to have those skills that help sell the need, show the value that third-party risk can provide back to the functional area, which is ultimately emphasizing the link between risk reduction and long-term profitability, both to the functional areas and to the shareholders. But there's a, there's a whole different communication dichotomy that has to exist, I think, with the new modern day third party risk team within the retail sector. Um, and it, it's a very exciting challenge that I have been uh, privileged to be a part of. And I think it's really interesting to hear how retail is getting on board with this, because traditionally retail don't spend a lot of money on security processes and things like this. So why do you think it is that they are investing in third party risk right now? I think that I think that I think that's a great question. Uh, I also think it makes sense why executives would feel that way um, of those retail companies. Um, <clears throat> specifically, I, I had an executive tell me one time that why would we spend a lot of money on the front end when we may or may not have to spend a lot of money on the back end to, to take care of the fines? And mm -hmm. it is a really valid question. Um, so we're seeing, we're definitely seeing a move now from a resource perspective to add a few more headcounts, to add a few more FTEs, because we're getting more and more involved with business processes. It's no longer just, if this is the full spectrum here, uh, this is when the contract is signed and this is when the business uh, understands that they need a solution to take place with a vendor. We would usually only be involved, you know, 24 months ago at the very end of the process. Hey, you got a day to take a look at this vendor. Give us a look and see if you think it's a good idea. Now we're being involved way on this end of the spectrum. And so we've become slightly victims of our own success relative to we, we have water spilling over the top of the bucket. The business is engaging us over and over and over earlier and earlier. And that has really helped proving and shape the need for our executives for a few more headcounts. But I think another way that we're, we are, we being the retail industry is dealing with kind of a low headcount bandwidth and where some of those investments are taking place or around um, automated and systemic implementation. For example, cybersecurity ratings are a great way from a continuous monitoring perspective to help replace, we use it to replace an FTE, a full-time employee. So uh, we use cybersecurity rating tools to help us continually monitor. So once that vendor is onboarded, we have parameters set up so that we can see if there are any changes to a cybersecurity rating, or let's say if they receive a botnet infection, or if there's a file sharing issue, or if we have that identity access control issues that take place, we can kind of see all that in fairly real time. And then from there, we can allocate a very small portion of a resource to uh, utilize that system in order to reach out to that vendor, say, hey, in a lot of cases, these vendors don't even know that these things are happening, at least to the degree as quickly as we do. And they can, we can work with that vendor to remediate whatever that, that control stint or issue is. Um, and then beyond that, for cybersecurity rating in, in a whole, in the retail sector, we still have those situations all the time where they say, hey, you got a day. You know, we're going to sign this contract tomorrow. We're going to lose you know, 200 grand in savings if we don't sign it tomorrow. And by the way, if we do contract this vendor, they guarantee us 40 million in revenue. It's really hard to get in the way of that. And getting in the way of that will not get you invited to the table. You'll hear me use that term a lot, get invited to the table in the retail segment. You will not get invited again. If, if, if every time a situation comes like that, you have to choose your battles. 
you have to do it from a risk perspective, but cybersecurity ratings is another really great way that we've been able to kind of keep headcount down. Um, well, make ends meet with headcount down and really utilize that as a really good way to say, hey, there's a cybersecurity rating. This is a third party, non biased, unemotional, non opinion, objective rating for the apparent security controls of this vendor. And that in and of itself, in those situations where we have, you know, very, very short limited amounts of time to even review the vendor in certain cases, it has been an invaluable tool um, because an individual, you know, an FTU couldn't cover that. And so there needs to be a really heavy blend of automation as well as leveraging technology tools in order to make sure that your third-party risk program is reaching a foundational level. And it absolutely, those, those technical implementations absolutely have, have to exist if you get into, if you want to get into maturity modeling, if you want to move into level two or level three of a maturity program in the retail sector. And we've been fortunate enough to have executives that care enough about the program that have allowed us to be able to leverage some, uh, some vendor risk tools as well as some cybersecurity rating tools. So, uh, again, privileged to kind of be able to work at the forefront of the industry relative to some of those tools. Did that answer your question? It does. And I'm really glad to hear you say that actually when those tools identify a problem, you're working with your vendors to go and fix them, because that's a great thing about what those tools can can do. They can spot those issues. So how do you find your vendors respond? Are they pleased to get that uh, kind of call from you or is it a bit of a mix? I'd say it's a bit of a mix. Um, obviously, the bigger the vendor is, the harder it is to communicate with them. And that's, that's I, I don't really know a way around that. We've looked for ways to kind of entice some of these multinational corporation vendors um, to help us remediate some things and remediate others. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a mixed bag of what has been successful and what has not been. Overall though, I think for the most part in those instances, especially with, with the use of like a, a cybersecurity rating tool, where we can help those vendors pinpoint in a lot of cases issues that they don't even know exist. Um, it has been a overwhelming positive response rate from a gratitude perspective, as well as help needing to fix uh, security controls and, and, and help rating. Nobody wants to see their score go down. Like in every, every American citizen um, uh, has a, uh, a uh, I'm drawing a blank, excuse me. Uh, has a yeah has a credit score um all i could think of fico for some reason has a credit score these companies in the same way have the same thing from a cybersecurity rating perspective they do not want it to go down and especially as cyber insurance becomes more and more prevalent these cyber insurance companies are going to be heavily leveraging um, i don't want to quote a percentage because i might not be up to date but it's an overwhelming percentage of these cyber insurance companies one of the first rate standard that they are now using to help qualify you from a premiums perspective is your company's first party cybersecurity rating score. And so all of these companies, most of these vendors that we're working with know that. For the ones that we don't, we, we implement and help doing some coaching, but the, the rating tool uh, users too, as they're working with that vendor to provide some remediation effort, they will also do a wonderful job in helping, uh, helping you understand, uh, helping you communicate with your vendor relative to why all this is taking place. But I think too, it's, it's another invaluable part of the technology that has to be implemented. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I think there's some really useful stuff in there around how to go and implement a program. So very grateful for you joining us. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure to sit with you. Thank you.